from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Please welcome to our stage, Carla Hayden and David Ferriero. Well, we How have you been? We call ourselves partners in crime. We are. But we're not going to talk about the crime part of it. Right? <laughs> we're just going to talk about the partner part. Well, what's been really interesting uh, since I've been in the position of Librarian of Congress is the fact that people ask me, well, what does the National Archives do? What, what do you is, mean? What, the, what does that mean? What does the archivist do? You're the library in a Congress. And then this, uh, there's a confusion about the histories and the roles of each of the institutions. And I've learned a lot uh, in that, even about the tank coming up to Finally. reclaim uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. And was there a third? We call it the Constitution. <laughs> that were held by the Library of Congress and that type of thing. So could you Well, you got, you got an earlier start than we did. It wasn't until the 1930s that um, the United States got serious about its records. It was Franklin Roosevelt who was passionate about records that we actually uh, created the, he, he signed the legislation that created the National Archives. The charters that Carla is referring to had been in the custody of the State Department and then at the Library of Congress. And um, when the archives building was built, a beautiful tabernacle was created for the Declaration of Independence. Doors opened in 1935, but the Librarian of Congress refused to release the Declaration. <laughs> and I've held that against you ever <laughs> since. I wasn't born yet, but I knew <laughs> this was going to happen. And it wasn't until Harry Truman came into office that um, he kind of laid down the law with the new Librarian of Congress that they really needed to deliver that document where it belonged. So as Carla describes it, it was, a, it was a really military ceremony with tanks and military people lining the steps of the, and she claims she always describes it as a grab for the declaration, but <laughs> Tanks, it was the literally transfer of the document to its rightful place. And we have photographs, photographs <laughs> of the people, the, the tanks with the, what are those? The, Howitzers. <laughs> yes. Right there waiting. And you can imagine the curators and the librarians thinking, well, maybe it's time. And who was the Librarian of Congress then? Do you remember? Oh, I forget. Someone here must remember. Someone here. Winston Tab is here. He is my oh, check on yeah. all the time. You were here. What was the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, that was the start of the kind of uh, clarification of roles and to really divide up things. The archives was created to... Um, to collect and protect and make available the records of the United States government. So anything that was created by the government. So the question, the natural question is, what about the stuff that was created before 1934 when the legislation was signed? A lot of it is in our custody. Some of it is at the Library of Congress. Um, since the materials were stored in attics and basements all over town, a lot of it was lost through the fire and theft and flood. Um, but what we have now is um, a, a, d a dividing line between everything the government creates, and that's me, and everything they don't create, which is you. And sometimes I like to, and there are times when I'm glad you're you. <laughs> I've learned that. And there are times when I wish I were you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, it, and I've described it in uh, another way, too, uh, that, for instance, uh, 
Truman and his uh, official records might be with the Truman Library, and I really like to get into those things too, uh, with the presidential libraries, and some of the letters that he wrote to his family. So the person uh, is where you might the things that the person, the diaries, all of the things like that, the personal part and the personal life of an official uh, might be at the Library of Congress. And so the papers of 23 presidents from George Washington to Coolidge are at the Library of Congress. And we were both in Starksville, Mississippi. Starksville, Mississippi, where Ulysses S. Grant is still probably revolving in his grave to and realize. And the Abraham Lincoln yes. uh, collection the Ulysses as S. well. Grant Presidential Library, Library is at, in, in Starksville. In Mississippi. Can you believe it? And we were there. We were. Uh, and so there, it, it turns project. out there are um, more than 200 presidential sites around the country people beyond the Library of Congress and the National Archives who have some kind of responsibility for some aspect of a president's life. And they're all meeting in Washington in August. And what's interesting about the presidential libraries, the Library of Congress has custody of the actual papers and documents of Ulysses S. Grant. And what some of the presidential libraries do is what they will collect and make copies of things from different collections about a president and Those put them in one sites, purse. That's right, yes. Place. And that's how the, some of the presidential libraries have been established. So when Franklin Roosevelt created the National Archives, he also decided to have a presidential library. So technically his was the first. I'm, I'm convinced he was a closet archivist. He was really passionate about his papers and understood the importance of archives. Spent a lot of time hiring the first archivist and spent a lot of time supporting that first archivist, Robert Connor, in his work as he was trying to figure out where the records are and more importantly to convince the agency heads to give up the records because that wasn't mm. something that people were interested in doing. Um, so Roosevelt created his, his own library. Herbert Hoover decided he wanted a library at that point, but this was all voluntary. It was all voluntary up until 1972 when, thanks to President Nixon and his thoughts that he owned his own records, um, that legislation was passed, the Presidential Records Act, which made it government property. So 1972 is kind of our marker for it. You have to donate. You have to give your papers to the National Archives. And so the role really became official then. Yeah. And then the other departments, and that's another uh, confusion that happens sometimes. It's a separate set of laws. Uh, Presidential Records Act was 1972. The Federal Records Act was, was created much earlier than that, and that guides all of the records management activities for the executive branch, so all of the 275. Uh, executive branch, cabinet level, and agencies and departments. What about congressional records? Of um, we provide, um, by a gentleman's agreement way back when, we provide courtesy storage for the records of Congress and service them. They are the records of Congress, <laughs> but they aren't at the Library of Congress. And you, and I want all of the uh, people watching and listening to realize that the, the joy of working with your colleagues, some that you've known, I've known um, David in his time at New York Public and all of that, is that you have this kind of friendly, kind of historical, whatever, competition. So when you and, talk about and some your, grudges, still carry and grudges. some grudges. So when you talk about, uh, you know, and, and I know you've seen that movie, National Treasure. Yes. You've got all yes. these kids, and they're doing it. But the Library of Congress has that first uh, printing that just had John Hancock on it. There and wouldn't have been that first printing if those original signers didn't sign something. See. And, Which I have. And David Ferriol. <laughs> right, right. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. And the Gettysburg Address, you know, that he <coughs> took on the field. That's right. The contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated. Right. I know. 
four locks of Thomas Jefferson's hair. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know, so there, there, it's kind of fun to have this kind of historical uh, back and forth with people. Oh, there's Tony Marks. He's got a few artifacts too at New York Public. Yeah, the so we're just going to bring him stolen from the Vatican by Napoleon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are a few things over there. So everybody's and let's not even bring up Hamilton, right? Let's right. okay. Let's bring up Hamilton. Lin we Manuel, have how did you pull of that allegiance. off? We have Hamilton. It's through the New York Public Library, actually. Um, Tommy Kale, Tommy Kale, who was the director of Hamilton was a member of the Library for the Performing Arts Visiting Committee, and he and I became good friends. And when we decided to honor Ron Chernow and Lynn manuel it was oh, through Tommy Oh, was that Kale really that good? We, we got all three of them in-house, yes. <laughs> well, we're not going to name drop, okay? Not at all. We're just going to let that go. Not at all. We're going to let that go. But we do oh. have Hamilton's Oath of Allegiance signed at Valley Forge by George Washington. And we just digitized the last note to his wife, Eliza. It's so much fun. <laughs> and then you get Tony have, on the side. We have like, a yeah. petition to the government outlining her poverty, asking for support from the federal government. And we just are finishing digitizing all of her correspondence for the rest of her life when she did his, and made yeah. and burnished his reputation. Yeah. So we what can else go are you on. Doing in the digitization. We can go on. Anywhere. You're just name of historical figure. If they were official, that's what you have, though. That's right. So what are you doing in, what are we doing together in the digitization? Well, we are doing some cool stuff. Why don't you tell them a little bit about that? We're working on a terrific exhibit with the BNF, um, tracing the French role in the American Revolution, working with, I think you guys are involved in the New York Public Library. New York Public's very involved. The BNF, Library of Congress, and the uh, uh, And the National BNF, Archives. just in case yes. people and um, another project with the British Library, George, the, the Georges, two Georges. The two Georges, about the beginnings of this country, King George and our King George. We're calling it the two Georges because it's their George, George III, and George Washington. And the cool thing about it is that they were reading some of the same books at the same time. They had similar interests, and so the, it'll be a joint exhibit with the Royal Archives, mm -hmm, that's right. uh, Windsor. We didn't go to the wedding, but um, <laughs> our research timing didn't coincide. Uh, but the Royal Archives, uh, King's College, and William and Mary here. And so that type of collaboration uh, happens all the time. And we, we keep, and we mentioned Tony Marks in New York Public because in terms of a public library, that has a, a collection that complements some of the things that uh, we're involved in. New York Public is a library that we work closely with in different ways. So the burning question that people have asked me already, and it came up at a session, uh, one of the sessions, what do we do and how do we deal with technology going forward? some of the historical records now are going to be in a different format. They already are. And you've been really on the forefront of that with your, you were putting a hard stop on collecting in We've, um, analog. In our, I'm sure you've read in the, in the press about the president's reform plan that was just issued last week. If you go to page 103, you'll see a two-page description of the National Archives contribution to that reform plan. And what it spells out is a message that we've already delivered to the agencies that um, we are no longer accepting paper at the end of 2022. They have until 2022 to get their paper to us that they have that that's in their custody now that is 
scheduled to be transferred, um, but after 2022, it's digital only. So the agencies have already been prepared for this. They've already, m many of them, 85% of them about, have been already digitizing their records. So we're in pretty good shape that way. But, most of the, but the most important factor is that those agencies are already creating their records electronically, and they have been for some time. So this is not you know, a great surprise, great shock. And just a, a, a data point, since there, I know that there are some people who are confused about what's going on with the Obama, the planning for the Obama library. It turns out that the, um, more than 80% of the Obama records are born digital. There is no paper equivalent. So the plan is, with the agreement of the Obama Foundation, that we will create the first all digital presidential library. Hmm. And the money that would have been invested in creating a physical facility in Chicago is going to be devoted to digitization of that 15% that isn't already digital. And that's, you know, a, a very different model for presidential libraries. It's a very different model for how we deliver information, service presidential records, but it's an exciting opportunity for us to rethink a, a whole new a whole new way of communicating, connecting with our um, users. Are you going to be borrowing some techniques from museums and things in terms of how you display? The, um, the plan is that the foundation has already designed and will build a museum, and we will loan to them um, artifacts, because the presidential libraries are a combination of paper, film, um, photographs, and lots of artifacts, gifts from foreign heads of state, gifts from the American people, more macaroni pictures than you've ever seen <laughs> in your life. The things from children, yes. hopefully? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Every, every one of the presidential libraries has this, this kind of collection. So those are the kinds of things that will end up in the, in the museum part of the... What about letters from young people? That's part of, those are all digitized now. Oh, They're all digitized. That should be very cool yeah. to see all the letters, and, and I know that's a big part Well, that's part important of it. to me because um, when I became the archivist and met with the directors of the presidential libraries for the first time, the director of the Kennedy handed me a copy of a letter that a kid wrote to the president asking for information about the proposed Peace Corps, and it's a letter from me. Two weeks later, the Eisenhower called to say they'd found two letters from me, President Eisenhower, and when I visited the LBJ library, they gave me a copy of the letter that I sent to LBJ congratulating him for signing the Civil Rights Act. David, you've been working on this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. So um, I'm sure you've heard about our sleepovers, and one of the activities during our sleepovers uh, is an opportunity for the kids to write a letter to the president, and we deliver those letters to the president on the next Monday morning, and the White House then supplies us with a letter that we can send back to them thanking the uh, kids for their, their interest and um, some words of encouragement signed by the president, which is a nice And, and I must nice tell you, touch. there have been wonderful moments and things that have been challenging, but one of the most challenging has been trying to figure out, as a former children's librarian, right, how I can top this wonderful thing that you do with children in the archives. They sleep over by the Constitution, right? In that wonderful place, there they are, it's night, and they're spooky, and they're really having fun. And then the next morning, and I've heard so many people tell me this, you know, the archivist of the United States bakes pancakes for the kids <laughs> the next day. So now, I, don't worry, we have Thomas Jefferson's recipe for macaroni and cheese, because, you know, we did that. I'm trying to get David and David. She has been trying to horn into this event since she arrived. <laughs> this is, and, and this is really true. <laughs> because I have. I said, OK, maybe we can make a it a progressive, progressive weekend. See, he knows. <laughs> I've got him. At least you're saying it, David. 
right? Don't you think that'd be neat? So we have a new gang of three, you know, in Washington, they have gangs of four and five and eight and everything. So there's a new gang in town, it's the gang of three. So it's David Scorgan, David Ferriero, and Carla Hayden. And we, the Smithsonian, the archives, and the library, and we've actually met and we talk about this. And we might have, what if the kids started out at the Natural History Museum, right? With all that stuff, and then that. <laughs> I think that would be for, or they slept there, because I think, you know, that's, so we're trying to figure this out. I and think, I think um, evening should be with us with the macaroni and cheese. I think Aaron Space, <laughs> I think Aaron Space already does a sleepover. See, Same. so we're, we're uh, working but you, together. But you though. did mention the fact that David Scorden, uh, that, that's an important yes. you know, thing that we should talk about, and that is the close working relationship that the three of us had, which is unlike, um, you know, I've been there for eight years, almost nine years now, and this is the first time that the three institutions have really gotten serious about working together. And it's fun because when, uh, I, and so I invited uh, the two Davids over to the Library of Congress for the luncheon. And of course, our curators and librarians put out the good silver, we call it, you know, all of our stuff, right? And they're in there. And we knew that um, this David was an art opera buff. So we had one of our music uh, librarians bring out this wonderful, these just opera things that tell them some of this stuff, because you know I didn't. It was the first printing of the first libretto um, for an opera. Right, and so. Which I had never, I've never even heard of, which was. He'd never crazy. heard of it. And then David Skorkin is a jazz yeah. uh, fanatic. So we brought out the Billy Strayhorn things that we had just gotten, and, and all the Jelly Roll Morton. And then the curator was so good, he knew opera and jazz. And could sing, so he and was, he sang. And he sang. <laughs> oh, we did that. Plus, we had the chicken salad thing and all that, you know, it was all, it was very nice, it was very nice. And so this curator had a piece by Jelly Roll Morton, who was known for jazz, that bridged the two uh, types of, of music, because Jelly Roll Morton did an operetta right. or did right. something, yep. and so he just slid right into that. Now, David Skorkin, and I think we can reveal this, wanted to get the card of the curator. Oh, yeah. So there is some poaching. He was that trying happened. to steal the curator. Right there. <laughs> right in front of her. <laughs> right in front long, of me. How long have you been here? Are you, are you happy here? Are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's happy. You know, and I had to yes, talk told to the him guy. He was happy. Yeah, I had to talk to the guy afterwards. <laughs> so are you happy? <laughs> So that kind of, but it's really a lot of fun when you start joining forces. Yeah, but the pressure, see, we're doing the next one. We're doing the next lunch. I'm afraid. And the pressure is already on about what are we going to show you. And that's, that's really the cool yeah. stuff because women's suffrage is coming up and you have a lot of things in Smithsonian. We're doing an exhibit. We even talked about it. You mentioned um, Air and Space Museum. Mm -hmm. You have, for the Wright brothers, some pretty cool things. Right, Brothers Patton, yes. The Patton, and the Library of Congress has the actual papers. David McCullough That's did right. his, uh, his book on the Wright Brothers was really based on that. Yeah. And then the Smithsonian has the plane. The model, yeah. 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 And so we're really working to see what are some of the things that we have that each of us can bring together for special exhibits to really uh, put things when one is having an exhibit on something, put something about it in our own institution. That's right. And the uh, Smithsonian, we were very pleased. We went halvesies uh, to purchase the first photo, known photo of Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be exhibited in the new, we digitized it, take, took care of it, and it's gonna be on exhibit at the new uh, Museum of African American History That's and Culture. Great. So That's that really type of... Yeah. And you'll, you'll see more of it. Now, we'll still have the friendly rivalries. You know, it's, it's always fun. We, when then Tony comes to play and puts his thing down there and all of that. But just getting this community of history and culture seems to be growing. And we work together for that. 
So what, um, what has surprised you? At the, about, at the Library of Congress? About working in Washington. Oh. <laughs> and Tony's over here going. <laughs> Tony's like. <laughs> I still live in Baltimore. Uh, and that I says commute. it all. That says it all. No, no, and I commute. And it's really interesting because I've uh, lived in other, when I lived uh, in Chicago, there were there's so many commuters that came in. People would come into Chicago from Gary, Indiana every day. And so this idea that mm -hmm. people come in from uh, different states, different places every day, and I've taken the train now, and you just see how many people come in to the city and then it, Goes, it, it's like elastic, and I didn't get a sense of that before. You know, you go in and you think, no, there are people who live there, and it grows and it mm -hmm. really expands. Mm -hmm. And how many? And there's a, a energy there that's similar to New York, where you go into New York and you just feel uh, a pace, and it changes. And that's why when I go back to Baltimore, it's like you know we have the Baltimore Huns and. It's, it's it's different. It's a, there, and there are a lot of young people, in oh, Baltimore, which is which is really. And they all exciting. walk fast, and they have two, <laughs> and they have two or three devices, yeah. and they're but, just. But they're all smart, oh, and they all they're all passionate about what they're you know what God, they're doing, and um, yeah. it's really it's really rewarding. The to brain work with, uh, um, power yeah. there is something, and uh, so the Library of Congress. Oh. Oh, you probably already do it. Probably. What is it? An another idea you've stolen from us? Yes. Because <laughs> we're going to talk briefly about one that I've been public about, the citizen archivist and the citizen historian, because mm. that is really cool. So we're working on, here you have in Washington, D.C., literally, some of the brightest, smartest young people you will ever, ever meet. And they are just... Some look like they're 12 years old, and they are policy, I mean, they're just something. And so we have tried to think of how can we get these young millennials, or they're not even millennials, some of them, right. they're that, um, engaged because they are so smart. So they want to do, so we've had scavenger hunts and a little Jeopardy and some really cool things to engage them. We have libation sometimes and things like that. But they, yes, Thomas Jefferson was a wine connoisseur. Uh, you know, we, we work it. Uh, to get these young people engaged in things that, because they want to still, they, they want to still learn. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are coming from these colleges and they're right out of college and they're you know, still at Georgetown and they're doing all this stuff. So they will sit and listen to someone talk about something or author or something. They will and they want to meet people. Um, one young congressional staffer said, you know, we're, we're, you know, our salaries might, you know, we're here. And so this is like date night. <laughs> You know, oh, yeah. They, yeah. they to go and do something kind of just so film uh, in the summer, uh, free popcorn. How about that? Big Ooh. Ooh. screen free popcorn. on the lawn, free with the machine. It's not just oh my god, with a yeah. machine too. With the machine, <laughs> with the machine, free popcorn, and so then they get to see. Oh, I think we might have you a little bit on that. No, I don't think so. Uh, wait let a me, minute. Let me okay, talk about wait the young founders. Not fundraising. Um, this is an idea that I took from New York Public Library, the Young Lions. Um, a similar kind of group, really interested in the library. Um, been in existence for, what, 25 years or so? F some fund a, um, an award, a fiction award for a young author. Um, and so I took that idea to um, the New York, to the National Archives, and we have a group, similar group that we're working with, the Young Founders Society, um, trying to engage them in the life of the National Archives. This is a group of folks who are drawn in all kinds of different directions, so getting them to, to focus has been the challenge. But We don't have a name yet. Oh, well. 
So we're working on that. I like young founders because then you feel oh, like you're. Oh, I know. I'm saying this is, but that's the yeah. good thing. So we are working on how we can get this a group, and it's going to be really though. Uh, actually, it's the same group of kids or young people. Probably. Uh, Probably. That yeah. will be going to these types of things. And well, if you have exciting. any literature you want me to share with my group, though. <laughs> well, let's talk about your citizen archivist, because sure. that one we just took almost verbatim and made it citizen historian because of the transcription and things. So when um, um, I was hired in 2009 um, by President Obama, and on his first day in office, he told his senior staff, that the government doesn't have all the answers and we need to figure out ways to engage the American public in solving some of those problems. And I took that to heart and worked with the staff to think about ways that we could engage the American public in the work that we do. And the result of that was the creation of the Citizen Archivist Dashboard, um, which has a number of activities that you can help us do our work, um, tagging photographs, um, identifying, um, you know, this has become, become fairly, fairly standard now, identifying people in, in places in, in photographs. But I think the, the centerpiece, the thing I'm, I'm most excited about is the um, transcription um, project that we have going on where we've loaded thousands of records. Um, kids aren't, aren't being taught sur um, cursive. <laughs> cursive Cyrillic. Or, or Cyrillic. <laughs> or Cyrillic. In, in Definitely anymore. not Cyrillic. <laughs> and I have billions of records in cursive, so we're you know, disenfranchising uh, an entire generation and future generations because they can't read this, this stuff. So we have people all over the country, actually all over the world, who are helping us transcribe in this Citizen Archivist um, dashboard activity. So that, that's um, a way that we're trying to engage the public in helping do our work. And we just put citizen historian <laughs> and took it because the model is so great and there is the same need at the Library of Congress. Right. Susan B. Anthony's papers, all of these people, Frederick Douglass, some of the things that are in cursive that literally young people and because of the writing, sometimes other people can't read yeah. these documents. So the Library of Congress is launching Citizen Historian, and we even reference and say it started with the National Archives, uh, Citizen Archivist, because we want people that are doing one to think about doing the other, too. Well, um, we're also working together on our History Hub site, where we're, our reference folks are sharing, collaborating, right. and providing reference service to anyone who has a a particular reference question. We're fielding um, and sharing information from our own collections to solve the research needs of um, the people who are using History Hub. So that's a, another, and we're bringing uh, the Smithsonian on board with that right. also. And, and I noticed that your folks were at the National Archives last week for um, an edit-a-thon, a Wikipedia edit-a-thon. Yes. So we're, we're working together yeah, on Wikipedia. Working together. And I also want to share what I know we've talked about a little bit, the concern about history going forward and records being created d digitally and how we uh, deal with storage issues, security technology keeping up in the future. And there's real concern at times that future historians, how will they get these items as history is being made in a different format? It's, um, it's the one thing, of all the things that, that keep me up at night, this That's is the, the one, one that keeps me up at night. Yeah, it's ensuring that, you know, our mandate is to ensure that people have uh, access to the records in perpetuity. And, you know, we're bar barely able to, to guarantee that in paper, um, but being able to guarantee that in, in the electronic environment is is, um, is. The, is our biggest challenge. And I always have in the back of my head um, the work that Nicholson Baker did um, in a book entitled Double Fold, yes. where he chastised us um, for microfilming all of those early American newspapers and throwing out the originals. 
and leaving us in a situation where here in the United States we did not have copies of our own newspapers. That's right. Um, because the microfilm was, and the microfilm was so poorly created and um, disintegrated in some cases, but there was no, in, some, in lots of reels, no quality controls, so the images weren't perfect. And the worst thing was that many of the, the, uh, the Herald, New York Herald, was the first, I believe, first newspaper to int introduce color into the comics on Sunday, in the Sunday, Sunday editions, and the newspaper microfilm is black and white. So we lost the whole sense of our history um, in, a, in a flawed project. And but I am happy to report, <laughs> Nicholson Baker, um, um, the, the month that the, in, that the book came out, Nicholson Baker's book came out, the librarian community, of course, had circled the wagons, and Nich Nicholson is our enemy. And, <laughs> and I was opening a new storage facility at Duke University, and I needed a speaker. And I oh. invited Nick to come and be our speaker to open this, because here is this warehouse of paper. It was, it went, isn't this wonderful, Nick? And we had dinner. Nick had. Um, raised the money from his borrowing from his in-laws to buy from the British Library the only paper copies that existed. The British Library was just deaccessioning them, and Nick bought them and set up a warehouse in New Hampshire. He became a newspaper librarian and was providing photographs and things, scanned images from this collection. So I invited Nick to be our speaker. He came. Um, we had dinner, and I told him. Um, when you get tired of playing newspaper librarian, this wonderful new facility that you just dedicated would be a great place to house them. And so those newspapers are at Duke University now. Right. <laughs> Thank God. So I always have that in my mind when I'm thinking about what we're dealing with with this electronic information. To, so that we don't get into the position where we've lost everything because of the security things, security. bad technology, you know, all kinds of issues. And the security thing, um, that becomes even more of an issue with the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the Library of Congress, for instance, has uh, storage modules, and they are modules, but think Amazon and, and yeah. what those warehouses look like. Um, in Fort Meade, military base, <laughs> I was gonna take that. The mm -hmm. uh, electronic environment in terms of security and making those transitions as technology progresses, mm -hmm. so there's that fiscal part, that's a, a major challenge too. Exactly, and we're, we're doing a lot of work with the industry to educate them about what the needs are um, around tools that, um, in my case, agencies need to create and maintain their records. Um, the, the situation in the, in the federal government is very much the situation that I remember from university settings where every agency, I mean every faculty, um, was able to go off and build their own system or buy something off the shelf and there was no interoperability, there was no enterprise uh, approach to technology, and that's that is clearly the description of the federal government. That the, so each department yeah. has its own right. way of dealing. So, with so it. the state of information, tech, the information technology infrastructure is not um, where it should be, and that's another issue that's outlined in the reform plan. Another another point that um, is in support of the work that we're trying to do. What about the resources to, well, to keep the, up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how's your budget? Uh, <laughs> well, the technology we've been actually uh, been very supported uh, in terms of the technology effort and bringing the Library of Congress uh, to be a, a modern and very efficient, and that's been uh, very heartening coming in and seeing that and having that kind of support. And you know that you have to maintain it and uh, also, the staffing that you need to have that digital strategy that's going to mm -hmm. be able to look forward and keep going. So we just um, hired a digital strategy manager and are going to do more with that because we have to. We have to look out and also look back. 
at the same time. Exactly. So it's a fun time in we a lot put, of we ways actually because we're that. getting a lot of um, uh, people from the technology sector that are coming into the library to work and to help us try to solve some of these things. And that's brought a, a, some energy and, and some cross-fertilization that's been really exciting for us. That's something we should put on our agenda for the, the three of us when we Yes, do. the technology. Mm -hmm. And we even had, and I'm referring back to Tony, one of his, uh, he hired someone from Great Britain to come BBC. over to BBC. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a technology digital guru. And we yeah. had him come to the Library of Congress and talk to our staff about uh, what New York Public is doing, their app. We're a little jealous of some of the stuff. But uh, they're doing a lot of cool things, and we had him come. So just this cross-fertilization between institutions, between uh, types of libraries, archives, has been, I think, helpful for us to mm -hmm. share and say, hey, we have common problems, and what can we do together? Now, the, we have the young professionals. We have the children. Are you working on things for seniors? Things for seniors. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're planning a sleepover for. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a wonderful partnership with AARP, I must say. They've supported the book festival and some other things. and. We have a lot of support from them also. I know you do. <laughs> but what can we do to engage seniors? And as I mature, that becomes a, a particular interest. Uh, we, do have, well. we do have, it's, it's been interesting to watch this um, transcription project because there are a number of senior centers mm -hmm. and nursing homes. There's a nursing home in Lynn, Massachusetts, who oh. has adopted us and is doing transcriptions. Yes. Which I think is wonderful. And see, that's in terms of retired professors yeah. and people that want to keep engaged. Yep. And because you can do it remotely, that uh, with limited mobility uh, with a lot of seniors, this is a way that they can keep involved and keep that. But we're going to have, uh, I won't even, well, I can preach. What are you doing? About cooking, too. Oh. Hmm. Macaroni Stay tuned. Probably. Stay yeah. tuned. The Library of Congress has one of the world's largest collections of historical cookbooks. Mm -hmm. So imagine what programming you could do with that. Amazing. Mm. Not going to say anything because he'll steal it. Because he probably has the patent to whatever, the, the mixer uh, or something like that. You do. Well, you do. before your time, we, uh, we had a blockbuster exhibit called What's Cooking Uncle Sam about the government's role in food, which told the story of a horrible story about testing preservatives and uh, the changes of the food groups the, uh, over time. Did you know butter used to be a food group? Butter. I still <laughs> think it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Yeah. Well, the, and I, I have to talk about your uh, shop. You just renovated and you uh, have a new education center and your shop is to die for. It yeah, I know, wonderful. I heard you were trying to steal my shop manager. I was scouting, you know, <laughs> we're renovating our shop. We're renovating our shop, I had to do a field trip and I did talk to the nice lady. Uh, <laughs> She seems moderately happy. <laughs> I mean, she did your shop. She's ready for a new challenge. We stole her, you know, we stole her from the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying a word with that one. And Letting her that first one go. Year, in her first year, she introduced socks into the repertoire and um, $100,000 worth of socks in the first year. That's right. Your shop, the, the really cool thing about the archives in the, in the shop is that when you're in a section, and they have sections that are just wonderful uh, about subjects and, and eras, World War II and all of this, um, 
there are the terminals right there that connect you to the collections and what else you can do. So right when you're making that decision about purchasing, you also are being tied to the archives and that. And so that's what really uh, makes it not just a, a retail experience, those are great, but the tie-in to the content of the archives is what we really got it. So the, the, if, you've, if you've never been to the National Archives, there are two entrances, one on Pennsylvania Avenue and one on, on Constitution Avenue. The Constitution side is when, if you want to come in and see the charters and the exhibits and the museum side of the house. And the other side is for research. Um, you come in that, that door to use the collection to do research. And, and I've been, since I got there, trying to figure out ways to break that wall, break a hole through that wall so that there's more interaction on, on both sides so that you get a taste uh, in the, on the museum side about what's possible. Genealogists, genealogy is our biggest um, market. That most, more, <laughs> more genealogists than anything else, more genealogists than veterans and then everything else um, after that. Um, but some way to um, use the experience, immediate experience from the museum on the other side in the research, on the research side to get people uh, more interested and excited about not just genealogy, but our, our records in, in general, and learning more about our history and more, most important, learning about civics and how the government yes. works and what the three branches of government are and what their responsibilities are as American citizens. That's what right. um, I'm trying to figure out. Well, we all are. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.